you know how it goes with the overnight guy. Mm-hmm. He just plays a couple of songs, and then the morning guy shows up late. Big deal. But it was 6.30 by then, and nothing was happening. We'd gone through two newscasts. The news department's looking at me like, what are you going to do about this? And I said, I'm calling everybody I know. The regular program director was out of town, and I couldn't reach the guy who was supposed to be coming in to relieve me anywhere. So this went on until like 6.45, and finally I just said, okay, I got to do something, and I went on the air. That is the voice of Southern California DJ and the current general manager of Res Radio, KPRI, John Fox. Now, last time John shared the story about how he got the inside track about how 100.7 KFM BFM San Diego was going to be switching to top 40. And what other work did you do at uh, at B100 uh, when you were doing the behind the scenes work? So, when they once they hired me full time, I. Um well, first I became more and more part-time work, and the first thing they found for me to do was uh, be the bin boxer overnight on the AM side. So KFMB was, you know, middle of the road top forty, a lot like KMLO, and B one hundred, of course, was high energy mm-hmm. top forty rock. So uh, the overnight show was not; it was live, but there was no no live DJ there. All I did was play records and tracks. Mm. And uh, both stations were union at the time. So, you know, that was one union slot they didn't want to fill. So that's another reason that they weren't live and another reason that I wasn't on the air live because I was not union at the time. I did actually get on one time. And uh, we started out, when I started there, they were still downtown at Fifth and Ash, which was kind of an historic district for uh, radio in San Diego. KCBQ had been at Seventh and Ash for a long time, and uh, in fact, in the mid-late 50s, there was a feature in, I think it was Life magazine, that pictured the uh, glass studio, the second floor glass studio of KCBQ at 7th and Ash, which is where all the kids used to gather down the street and watch the DJ upstairs. They actually put a mirror, uh, an angled mirror in the ceiling in the studio up there so the kids could see him working the controls. That was kind of fun. Shotgun Tom Kelly has wonderful stories of being among that group on the sidewalk wow. watching watching Dollar Bill Bailey. He's got a terrific photo of Dollar Bill Bailey in the studio. He actually weaseled his way in one time and took a photo of him. It's a really great photo showing <laughs> Bill and the KCBQ uh, handmade console, which Shotgun now owns and has in his home studio, and uh, the big picture window with the street outside, El Cortez Hotel across the street. So, yeah, that was a lot of, that was that was a very interesting neighborhood. Uh, K, uh, KYXY was right across the street in one of the um, other El Cortez complex buildings. After KCBQ moved to Santee in 58, uh, about 10 years later, KPRI moved into the downstairs office of that same 7th and Ash building. And you recall in the movie Almost Famous, the mm-hmm. scene in KPRI? Okay. That was filmed in the building across the street where Kixie used to be. Not in their studio, but in the building. And through the window in that scene, you can see across the street where KPRI actually had been. 40 years earlier. So there's wow. an interesting history, interesting history in that neighborhood. And those buildings are still there to this day, is my guess. Uh, most of them. The 5th and Ash KC, uh, KFMB building was torn down many, many years ago, not long after we moved out. It's been a parking lot ever since. Uh, but the um, 7th and Ash KCBQ and KPRI building is still there. Uh, it was... Ace parking for a long time, and somebody else has it now, but the building is still there. El Cortez is all gone, but the um, extra building that housed the radio stations is, I believe, still there. I haven't been to that neighborhood in a few years, so don't quote me. Yeah, I mean, San Diego has done a lot of renovations of the the historic buildings, especially (laughs) since the opening of uh, Petco Park about 20 years ago. So it's nice to Mm -hmm. see the revitalization of downtown San Diego Whenever I go down there. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, K- and KGB was off by itself on Pacific Highway, so I never did get over there. Uh, I didn't see that until years later when I was in college. I went in there to interview one day, and yeah, I guess I didn't impress them much. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, KGB uh, top four, uh, rock and roll by that point? This was several years after they did the simulcast, uh, uh, the the Ron Jacobs recycle mm-hmm. thing, you know, where uh, uh, KGB, they, where they split up and KGB became top 40 and the FM side became rock up against KPRI. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I remember the Ron Jacobs uh, movement in there and the, the kind of like redoing of the format uh he was even making fun of Boss Radio during the uh, montage of clips he was playing, leading up to the to the format change. Uh, somebody said that he was getting paid twice as much as he made as program director of KHJ. Plus, he got two Cadillacs as uh, as an incentive as well. Well, the Browns were really, uh, you know, they were competitive. They were good, so I wouldn't be surprised if they threw that kind of money at him. Uh, <laughs> something that just doesn't happen anymore <laughs> no <laughs> you're lucky if you get a i don't know a yugo um <laughs> but um hey, don't knock it those things are collectible now yeah, that's true yeah it might be worth something <laughs> i saw one that was uh it was actually sold for exactly what it cost brand new <laughs> 39.90 Thirty- <laughs> <laughs> now tell us about how you got to finally be on the air on uh, on b100 Actually, my first on the air as a jock was on KFMB, and it happened by accident. And um, one morning, uh, I was doing the overnight bin boxing, and one morning the uh, the guy who was supposed to come in didn't show up. And the program director was unavailable to talk to. I mean, you know, normally I would just overlook it, and you know how it goes with the overnight guy. Mm-hmm. He just plays a couple of songs, and then the morning guy shows up late. Big deal. But, you know, it was 6.30 by then, and nothing was happening. We'd gone through two newscasts. The news department's looking at me like, what are you going to do about this? And I said, I'm calling everybody I know. The regular program director was out of town. The fill-in guy, who was also the afternoon guy, uh, wasn't answering his phone. And I couldn't reach the guy who was supposed to be coming in to relieve me anywhere. So this went on until like 6.45, and finally I just said, okay. I got to do something, and I went on the air and um, got some encouragement from the newsroom, Danuta, and uh, Richard Mock was there that day, I believe. He Now he'd moved over to KFMB, and uh, so I got some encouragement from them, and the sales staff was having a Saturday morning meeting at, I think, 7.30 or 8, so they were all starting to filter in, everything. they'd all walk by the studio going, oh, wondered who was on the air, <laughs> and then they'd go off to their... And finally, the sales manager comes through and looks at me. What do you think you're doing? I'm just, you know, making it happen. And I said, "You can't be on the air. You're not union. You can't do this." And you know, he—I mean, he didn't even know how that whole thing worked, but he just decided he was going to rip me a new one. Mm-hmm. And so then he went off, and that kind of worried me. And then finally, I heard from the. Um, um, uh, pro tem program director, and he said he actually confirmed my decision, and that was just to go on the air because he couldn't come in. He had an, an appearance to make that morning. Um, nobody else was available. He, she just said, "Just keep doing what you're doing. That's obviously the best choice." And probably around, I don't know, somewhere between seven thirty and eight, the the guy who was supposed to be there finally showed up. Um. A little the less for partying. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's, and somewhere, somewhere in, you know, my packed away trunks and boxes and whatnot, I've got that tape. Oh, wow. I, I had to take it off the logger because, you know, it happened also so suddenly I didn't even think to air check it. Mm. But, uh, you know, we had a logger tape for the um, traffic department at the time, so I was able to go back and lifted off of that so it's horrible quality but it is my first time on the air and um in uh what would that be it was late 77 were the, the you're those were those little uh mini reel-to-reels that went like i think it was about 
an inch and a half per second, or it was a really slow reel to reel. And you usually had to speed it up on a cassette tape in order to get the high quality sound, I think. Um, Cause I remember when I interned for uh, oldies 93 CBS FM it was at Columbia square and they had like four tracks on those little reel to reels. One was uh, KCBS FM 93 KNX 1070 and then KCBS TV channel two. Yeah, we had pretty much the exact same thing. It was actually a 10 inch reel to reel, pretty much like the old Ampexes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, here, this is, this is going to blow you away. I have the machine itself. Wow. It's sitting in our studios at KPRI. Uh, one of the one of my coworkers many, many years ago liberated it from storage after they stopped using you know tape and went to digital. Mm-hmm. And uh, he it was taking up too much space at his place. We did a reunion, a B100 reunion weekend on KPRI a few years ago, and we thought it would be a lot of fun to play old air checks. So from some of the better logger tapes, we lifted a few. He ended up bringing the machine up to our studios to do it, and it's been there ever since. But, yeah, it's an old te- uh, 10-inch machine. Um, they used both sides of the tape, so it's actually an 8-track machine. Mm. And... Uh, uh, just like uh, KCBS, one of them was AM, one was FM, one was TV. KFMB was an AM-FM TV combo. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one was the two-way radio, the company's two-way radio. So, um, yeah, that's that's where I lifted my my first air check. Wow, that's great. And now, how soon after that did you finally get your own on-air shift? It was a year or two, and that was on B100. Um, I never had a regular on-air shift on the AM. Mm. I did, during that year or two, I was the producer for the morning show, Hudson and Bauer. And uh, then after that, I switched to the FM side and stayed there for about, whew, let's see. I was there a total of 16 years, so I guess I was probably about 13 or 14 years on the FM. Now, the Hudson and Bauer show, when you're producing that, how often did you go on the air? Because sometimes they'll have the producers during a morning show chime in here and there. Almost never. That was them. Uh, They were the show, and the producer was just there to run things, keep a log, and, you know, tighten it up. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, they were doing it themselves, uh, for, oh gosh, I don't remember how long they were there before I got there, but they'd been doing the show themselves for years, but the current program director thought it was a little loose and the traffic department was complaining about always having to go back and fix the logs and, uh, they just wanted somebody to come in and, you know, take care of the business end of things. Um, uh, I learned a lot from them, but I never really worked with them as far as the programming. Mm. Learned a ton. Learned a lot, too, from Mark Larson. He's that program director I was mentioning. Yeah, I I worked with Mark a couple of years ago, sort of, kind of. I mean, uh, got to meet him a couple of times. Really nice guy. Just hilarious. I mean, <laughs> I, I just, you know... It's like, man, I wish I could get inside his brain to see how he comes up with all that, you know, wittiness just off the top of his head. There were some incredible people that came through KFMB. Uh, Don Burns in the afternoon, mm-hmm. he was he reminded me a lot of um, Dr. Don Rose. And he had this huge notebooks full of stuff, and he'd just constantly be flipping to him to get his, you know, bits or lines or a joke or whatever. And, uh, yeah, he was really good at um, accessing material that way. Mark, uh, Mark's big lesson to me was um, how to have a conversation with somebody who isn't there. Mm. In, other, in other words, doing a character and talking to a tape. So I learned how to do that from Mark. I'll send you an air check of that. I've got one I'm pretty proud of uh, where I play Mike Tyson and I'm talking to Mike Tyson. <laughs> I'd love to hear that. <laughs> Um, let's see, who else? 
Scruff Evans was an awfully good, awfully good guy. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, one who was uh, who had left just before I got there. Oh, what was his name? I'll think of it as mm-hmm. we talk. But yeah, he 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 had moved over to Kogo by then, and uh, he was just awfully funny, just off the cuff funny all the time. Wow. It, it wasn't Phil Flowers, was it? No, Phil was doing the overnights on the FM. In fact, he became my co-host at uh, KCBQ when I did that nostalgia show. Mm. I still queue in my car, and Mark was the program director there. That's right, at KCBQ at the time. This was around two thousand. Yeah, and then so many great personalities. I've uh, uh, I interviewed. Um, he was on uh, B100 for a short time. He's mainly in Sacramento radio. Uh, Will he be good? I talked oh, yeah. to uh, last year, and so I'm not sure if he was the one you're referring to or not. Oh, no. No, Will he be uh, – <clears throat> he – that was actually quite a uh, coincidence. Will he be and Jimmy Fox and Dave Conley, and was there anybody else? At least the three of them, maybe a fourth had left to uh, go create 10Q in Los Angeles the mm-hmm. day my internship started on B100. Wow. And, well, maybe not the day, but within a few days, because the day I started was also the day Danny Wilde took over in the afternoons because they'd left. Yeah, in fact, uh, B, uh, K, uh, 10Q, if you listen to the, some of their air checks, their jingle sound just like the KCBQ jingle from like 1972. Um, mm-hmm. I was like, oh my goodness, that's the exact same jingle. Well, you know, those jingle packages are not unique in, in most cases. No. Uh, you you could go to any, in fact, you went to any of the Q stations, which, you know, KCBQ was the originator, but then because of its success, it, you know, they duplicated it in many other markets, WHBQ, and I think at least a half a dozen others, and they all had the same jingle package. Yeah, kind of like the uh, Johnny Mann singers for KHJ, K, uh, KGB, and KFRC. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, most of the jingle packages you came from uh, houses out of Dallas. For some reason, that was like the jingle capital. That's right, yeah. We are talking with Southern California radio DJ as well as program director John Fox. And next time, he tells us about his most memorable listeners over the years in the uh, theater of the mind. He also coaches me on the correct way to say KFM, BFM. Was I saying that correctly? We'll find out next time.